Thank you for letting me come back. It's good to see you again. Some of you uh, remember your faces, but not your names. Um, but I enjoy being here. It's, when I get up to speak, I feel like it's the frosting because we've already had really the, I guess, the cake. But in what we've sung and what we've read and what we've prayed, I, re I feel ready to go home. I, um, but I guess I can't. Um, so we're going to be looking at Psalm 73. Paul McCartney likes to take, uh, tell the story about his friend John. Uh, they used to work together till late at night at Paul's house. John lived down the road. And uh, John was uh, sensitive about wearing glasses. So a lot of times he would leave his glasses at Paul's house and walk home. And one day he came back the next day and he said, your neighbors on the corner are really strange. He said they were out there playing poker well after midnight last night. So Paul went down to the corner to see what that was about. And it was a nativity set. So, I mean, we don't follow the philosophy of the Beatles, but I thought that was kind of a funny story and illustrates the fact that, that glasses are an amazing thing, aren't they? For those of us who wear it, wear glasses, they're, they're like miraculous. I mean, I look at my Bible and there's just lines. They see nothing and I put them on and everything's clear. Um, and we understand that, but spiritually, there's the reverse kind of glasses where you put on these glasses of different uh, mindsets and they make the truth and reality distorted. And today, Asaf, who is the, the author of this psalm, uh, he is going to be wearing the lens of, of envy. So when you look through the lens of envy, what you're seeing is not real, and what you think you're understanding is not real. So we're going to watch that as we go through this psalm. Um, there are other uh, lenses that you can look through that distort things. Um, pride, greed, lust, all of those. Once you start on that path and you look at, at what's around you in reality and think about God and think about people, it's distorted. But we're going to look specifically at at envy. Asaph uh, was David's friend. Uh, David set him up as one of three choir directors, three cousins, were, were the worship leaders for the entire nation of Israel. So in the sanctuary they would lead and worship some of their own psalms and many of David's psalms and others as well. Uh, but that was his role, was worship leader of Israel, in a sense the worship leader. So it's a very important role, and what he's going to do in this text, Psalm 73, is confess his sin of envy and where it almost took him. So let's look at it. He starts out with uh, truly. In other words, this is a fact. In fact, this is so you can take this fact and put it in your fact bank and know that it's always true. It's always true that God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. So this is an important lesson for all of us. God is good no matter what it feels like. God is good whether you see him or not. God is good no matter what your circumstances are. God is even good when you sin. And some of his goodness will be discipline. We don't see that so much in this psalm with, with Asaph. But God is always good. Nevertheless, he says, but for me, he forgot it. And he wasn't pure in heart for a while because he had envy in his heart. And again, envy is sin. But as for me, my, heart, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. So sinning does not get you this, to this point where his feet almost stumbled. or it, it doesn't get you to the point of stumbling and slipping. Really, the idea is falling off a cliff. Um, last year sometime, there was a family at the beach, the Oregon Beach, and I believe four of them walked off a cliff. They were on a trail and they walked right off. Unfortunately, the father died. Miraculously, the three children didn't. The mother, being that mothers are generally smarter than fathers and children, didn't go off the cliff, but the rest did. So that's what this picture is. He almost got to that point where he fell off a cliff and what Paul called shipwrecked his life and really the life of his ministry, and it could have been many more people than just him. But I love these two words, almost and nearly. Aren't they great words? I almost stumbled. I nearly slipped. I didn't slip. Why? Because God kept it from slipping. Ever been there? 
You look back at your life, were there times when you almost shipwrecked your life, almost did something that you couldn't recover from? Well, also said, I was right there, but I didn't. Why didn't he? Psalm 121, which we read the first two verses, the third verse. Now, the first two verses, I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. It's his job to keep our foot from slipping. Uh, Jude, verse 1. Now unto him who is able, or that's not verse 1. Verse 1 says that we are kept for Jesus Christ or by Jesus Christ. And the last verse 24 says, Now unto him who is able to keep us to, um, I've got it all mixed up. Anyway, he keeps us from stumbling and falling. And he does that so he can present us faultless before the throne of God. So God's at work. He keeps us from that final step that would take us over. But we'll see how close us of God. Verse 3. Isn't that great? Isn't that word nearly great? I love it, that word nearly, because I don't ever want to get there. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So he names his sin. This really is a confession. The psalm uh, through verse, at least through verse um, 16, is a confession of his sin. And his sin was envy. And look who he envied, the arrogant wicked. Why in the world, Osif, would you envy the arrogant wicked? You know that that's not good. You know that you don't want to be them, and you don't want their ending. But he did. Why? When I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Also, if you're looking at the wrong thing. Envy begins with uh, discontent. We're not quite content with who we are, where we're at, who we're with, our job or whatever. And who doesn't feel that from time to time? Because we're never, you know, as much as we would like to be. But... It moves into envy when we start looking around and seeing where other people have it better, at least in our, in our minds. And so he started looking at the arrogant wicked and said, their lives are better than mine. But he uses a word that you know. The word prosperity is the word shalom, which is usually translated peace. Um, so he thought that the wicked had shalom, but we know because... A number of years later, Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 48, verse 22, that there is no shalom for the wicked. Now, the word shalom is that you have all that you need and a little more. It's like the number seven. God only needed six days to create the universe. He probably didn't even need that. But he took six days to create the universe, but he took seven days. He had one just to relax and enjoy his creation. That's what the number seven is. It's enough and a little more. And shalom is that. It's enough and a little more, but peace is at the center. Prosperity is a good word for shalom because uh, in the Bible, especially the Old Testament, prosperity has a very positive uh, connotation. It's It's a good thing. It's where you want to be. We would maybe say that he looked at their success because you can be successful and incredibly evil. So he's looking at their success, but he's calling it shalom. It's not shalom. So here's an important uh, note on Bible study methods. He writes that they had shalom, but we know from Isaiah they didn't have shalom. So we're seeing these people from, from Asaph's point of view, his lenses, his thought bubbles. And in that, he sees that what the wicked are experience is shalom. But we know it's not, because Isaiah tells us. So the, the, the method that we have to see here is that you can't pluck a verse out of the Bible, out of the context, and make doctrine out of that. You could say that, whisper, uh, that the wicked prosper, but they don't. They don't have shalom. We know that. And so the rest of it, uh, four through Uh, through most of the text we're going to look at this morning, what Asaph is going to see is not true. We're going to see that as we go. He's looking at it through the wrong lens, which, by the way, I did this the last time too. The first blank is uh, Asaph sets the stage. And the second blank we've started is Asaph looks through the lens of envy. So we start. So this this is his proof that what he's looking at with the prosperity and why... Uh, He was envying them. Verse 4, for they have no pangs until death. Now, that's just not true. 
We live in a fallen and broken world with lots of sin. There isn't a person alive that's not going to experience pangs. As he's saying, they never broke a bone. They never had a broken relationship. Uh, They never had a financial setback. Uh, They never got sick. No, they've had pangs. But Ossip's not seeing it. He's seeing them as people that have never felt any pain. But even if that was true, even if they didn't feel pain, that's a terrible thing. Because it means, for one thing, they didn't love anybody. If you love somebody, it's going to hurt. I don't mean when they break up with you. That hurts. But, I mean, just period. If you love someone, if you love a child, there's going to be pain involved in that. If you love your parents, there's going to be pain involved with that. If you love a friend, whoever it is, there's always pain involved in love. So if they're experiencing no pain, it's because they haven't loved anybody. That's terrible, isn't it? They also have never... When we hurt ourselves, it reminds us of our mortality. It's one of the good things about COVID, which there's not very much good, but when it first came out, the media started talking about the fact that we were going to die. Remember when COVID first came out, we're all going to die. And they talked about it a lot for months, talked about the fact that we're going to die. And I loved that because you can talk to anybody then about the fact that you're going to die. Are you ready? And when you know you're going to die, it's really important to be ready for that time. But then all of a sudden, of course, they found out, no, if you follow these protocols, you won't die. And then I'm thinking, you know, for how long will you not die? I mean, it didn't change anything. It may have kept you from dying of COVID, but it wasn't going to keep you from dying. But it went away. No, you can live. And uh, you got the impression, didn't you, that you can live forever if you just follow the science. So I'm not making a political statement here. I will later about something else. But this I'm just saying that I missed the days when everybody was going to die. Because that's what scripture teaches us. That's what history has taught us. Everyone's going to die and it's good to know about that. So they're not thinking about that. They're not having any any pains. Nothing is reminding them that they're mortal. And they need to think about that day of their death. Uh, There's many other things uh, that without pain you're really not experiencing the fullness of life. But this next one I love. Their bodies are fat and sleek. (laughs) How many people like that do you envy? Uh, Their bodies are fat and sleek. Now, it's even even worse than this. Um, Because the word body is not the usual word for body, but the word for your paunch. So in other words, they have a beer belly. So, and I don't even know what sleek means. Um, But, so their bellies are fat and sleek. It it sticks out there in front because this word in some cases means porch, front porch. So the idea of this word is what you present when you're you're meeting someone. So Ossip's is saying when I meet these wicked, you know, the first thing I see is their belly. And man, I wish I had a belly like that. You know, really, the, the fact is, it's not healthy because how did they get you? How do you get a beer belly? Well, you get it from eating, I suppose, drinking too. But these people ate and drank too much, and that's not good for you. I had a guy last, I got to throw this in, a guy, when I said that, he got up and left, and he had a little paunch. It wasn't necessarily, he got up and laughed. And I think he was out getting coffee, because afterwards we laughed about it. <laughs> he goes, you mean like this? <laughs> but we don't envy it, and also shouldn't envy it either, because that's just ridiculous. But see how ridiculous that is, how we get, when we're looking through the, the lens of envy, we'll envy anything, if it's different from us. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. So again, he's back to that idea of no pangs. Now, this is definitely not true. But if you're the arrogant wicked, especially you're arrogant, you have to put on a facade that you're not in trouble because you can't be vulnerable. If you're vulnerable, vulnerable you're just like the rest of us, and you can't look down on us and, with pride. So you've got to put on that, that pretense that nothing phases you. So we'd say that. Nothing phases them. You know, they just go through life. Everything seems to be just fine. Well, you don't know what's going on inside, all the turmoil and all the pain. But Asif's looking through these envy uh, glasses, and he's believing their story, that they're okay. Verse 6, therefore pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. It's interesting, it follows that, the therefore, because they are vulnerable. We all are. We're all um, weak. 
in many different ways. And so in order to mask the fact that they're vulnerable and weak, they put on a necklace of pride. So that's what you look at if these, the word is really chained. So it would be like a big gold thing hanging around their neck. It's not a pretty necklace that some of you wear, um, but just something that will draw your eye. And you think about that, think about how rich they are. And then they wear violence as so pride is that for them and you, they wear violence as a garment so they clothe themselves with violence so you can't see what they really are uh, in their in in their skin because then they can't be pride anymore proud anymore so what a thing though and what a thing if if uh, Asif is is envying this he's envying that there's no trouble I don't know that he's envying their pride and their violence but it looks like it and the idea is that they they can do this and doing all that they still have no trouble it's not true but that's how he's thinking now here's the clincher for me their eyes swell out through fatness that don't sound good to me sounds like a pathology um, I was talking to Dr. David and he said that it could that I forgot anyway Thyroid, that was a word I couldn't remember. That you could have a thyroid issue and that make your eyes bulge. Uh, we don't want that. <laughs> That's not good. But I don't understand what this through fatness thing is. I, I don't get it. But why would you envy that? See, what I'm trying to show you is that when you're looking through the lens of envy, you, you, you get crazy. And you envy things that you should not envy as a child of God. As a human being, really, in that one. Then their hearts overflow with follies. This is kind of the same thing in, a, in an inward way as the outer eyes of bulging. Uh, the word follies is imaginations. Follies is a good translation because their hearts, which in Scripture is the center of our being, it's where we think, where our emotions, is all that. So what's coming out of the center of their being is folly. And the, it gives you the idea that it, they're out of control, that they're ne they never stop thinking. Of what? Of thinking of how they can improve their lives or how they can uh, help their family or how they can get in a deeper relationship with God? No, they're thinking about stupid things they can do and ways that they can misuse people and ways that they can get ahead. But it's all follies. It doesn't really get you ahead at all. But it comes pouring out of the hearts. They're out of control. They cannot anymore think straight uh, because of their wickedness. They set their mouth, uh, in verse 8, they scoff. This is a three-part thing that really you've seen in social media. If you're on social media at all, you've seen this happen. They scoff. It begins, in other words, you make fun of what the other person believes or has written or thinks. They scoff at it, you know, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. They don't say it like that, but that's the impression you get. Then they go to the second step, which is uh, they speak with malice. So they, they move from putting down your thoughts or whoever's thoughts to putting down the person. If you're thinking this stupid thing, that's because you're stupid. Uh, so the name calling um, and all those things. Uh, and then thirdly, they threaten oppression. So this is what's going to happen to you if you stay on this course, uh, sometimes by me, uh, other times by the government, or whatever. Uh, they threaten oppression. And you've probably seen all this if you're on social media, unless you, you uh, pair your, your, all your friends down to two or three people uh, that agree with you. But I sure see, I just let everybody as a friend, I let them because I like to read what they say. I don't respond. But I like to see what's going on out there. And there's so much meanness, isn't there? Just so much meanness. I mean, it's rampant. And then it's not enough for them to speak about people. They set their mouths against the heavens. What do they know about the heavens? Have they been there? Um, I guess when the Soviets first went up in space, some guy looked around and said, I don't see God anywhere. <laughs> they hadn't even gone to the moon. And they're looking for God, the one who created heaven and earth who lives beyond the heavens, as Solomon tells us, when he built the temple. They don't know anything about the heavens, but they speak. You've seen this too, um, especially speaking about God. 
that there is no God or that if there is a God, he's weak or he's mean or all these things. They talk about God. They've never met him. They will, but they've never met him. And yet so blithely they speak about God. Verse 10. Oh, and their tongues stretch through the earth. The word earth and land is the same. So the idea with the there uh, in the, the holy land, they would strut through the land just saying whatever they wanted. Um, telling false doctrine, uh, saying uh, cruel things. But now it's true. With the internet, um, whoever wants to speak can speak to the whole world and strut uh, their lies to the whole world. We can, we, can, we can strut our truth to the whole world too. So there's a little bit of a blessing in it, but not much because the lies really take over. You all know that. And then they say, how does God know? Oh, verse 10. Therefore his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. So it's hard to understand what he's saying there, but what I think he's saying is that people still follow them. Even though what they say is foolish, even what they do is cruel, people will still follow them. It amazes me what people will follow. It amazes me in the church, the false teachers that people will follow by the droves. Lately, how could anybody be for Hamas? I mean, I, I understand, and I think that we should feel compassion for the Palestinian people, and we should be praying for them. Uh, but to support Hamas? They're evil. How can anybody support it? And yet they do, um, especially in opposition to, to Israel. But it boggles the mind what people will follow. That's why churches like this church need to hang on to the truth no matter what anybody else is doing because it's the only antidote to lies is knowing the truth and what the Bible says. I think when uh, in verse 11, right, I haven't done verse 11, they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? They're saying he doesn't know. Now, Asaph, the friend of David, David wrote Psalm 139, which if you've read Psalm 139, is about the omnipresence of God, that God is everywhere, he's with you, you can't go anywhere where he's not. So he knows you, and he knows what you're doing. In fact, at the, at the great white throne, there are books there that have everything that ever, anybody at the great white throne has ever done. Now, if you're at the great white throne, you have not been redeemed. You haven't had your sins washed away by the blood of Christ. You've not prayed to receive Jesus and accept his forgiveness. So we don't have a book. Our book's the book of life because Jesus has paid for all our sins. It's not recorded anymore. It's gone as far as the east is from the west, and that's a long way. Um, but for those who don't have Christ, there's a book with everything they've ever done and one day is going to come when God is going to reveal that he was there. He always knew. He always heard. Jesus said every, every idle word will come out. Not just the big bad things you do, but every idle word will be in that book and it will be read or shown and you will fall on your face uh, in, in despair because there's no repentance at that time the great white throne he does know he is here he does see right now he's gracious and waiting but what Asaph is seeing he knows that this is not right verse 11 but he sees that they're saying things like that and getting away with it see with the eye with the lens of envy he thinks people are getting away with it no God is gracious they're not getting away with anything maybe you've seen that today thinking people get away with their evil. They're not. Verse 12, behold, these are the wicked. Well, they're pretty bad. He's made a, a good case for them, but he certainly hasn't made a good case to envy them. But these are the wicked. Names them again. Always at ease, they increase in riches. So here's what sparked uh, Asaph's envy. They're comfortable. They're not even working hard and they're getting a bunch of money, and they keep getting money. It's about money. Seriously, Asif, it's about money? Yes, he says it is. That's, that's what he's looking at. Look at these people. They're wicked. They're against God. They're against people. 
but they keep getting money. And that, thinking about this money, moves them into verse 13, which is a terrible verse, a terrible thought, but Asaph thought it when he was looking through the lens of envy. All in vain I have kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. Isn't that a terrible verse? When he looks at the wicked and the money they're making, he says, I have kept myself clean. I've kept myself pure. I've followed the, the word of God. I've kept in relationship with God for nothing because I'm not making money like them. And I'm not sitting back comfortable like them and making money. So everything I've done has been in vain. This is the, the lens of envy. You've got to get rid of those lenses of envy if you're wearing them because what you're seeing is not true. Rather than preach it, I'm going to read what Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value, value in every way. It's always good to be godly. And also uh, for the present life right now and also for the life to come. So there is both present good in godliness and eternal good in godliness. And then in chapter 6, verses 6 through 7, Paul says, But godliness with contentment, which is what keeps us from envy, is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to, to be rich, which is happening to Asaph, fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. But praise the Lord, not Asaf, and hopefully not you, that you have fallen into that trap, that you um, want to, to prosper through not doing right. He knows that's not right, what he just said, all that, the vanity of it. He knows that's not right. Verse 14, for all day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. So what has stricken him and what has rebuked him? His conscience. Because it's told him that's not right. Uh, the Holy Spirit is telling him that's not right. The Word of God is telling him that's not right. And the believing community around him is saying that's not right if he talks to them about it. But at least those three things, conscience, spirit, and word, are, are um are striking him and rebuking him, spanking him and rebuking him. That's what they're there for, is to tell him when we're thinking wrong, you're thinking wrong. And what's he need to do to get rid of it? It's to take off the glasses. I don't watch horror movies, and it's probably a good thing for numerous reasons, but one is that if we were in the theater, I'd be the one to yell out, don't go in there, or don't split up. What's the matter with you? Or don't smoke that dope. You're going to be the first one to die. So I'd be that guy, and I would be yelling at Asif, take the glasses off. Stop envying. That's why you have this problem. That's why you're feeling this every morning when you get up, because you're thinking wrong. If I had said I will speak thus, this is where he's at the verge of falling off the cliff. If I, had, if I will speak thus, if I had said I will speak thus, how would he speak that all godliness is in vain? If I'd said that, I would have betrayed the generation of your people, of your children. Remember, he's the worship leader for all of Israel. If he had told to them, go ahead and live any way you want because the wicked do it, and they keep continuing and they make a bunch of money, just live any way you want. Come in and worship on, on Saturday, for them it was, or any day of the week, actually, you go to worship at the temple. Um, you'll be all right. If I'd done that, I would have betrayed a whole generation of the nation. This says something about worship leaders. If you're a worship leader, your authority is just as important as the authority of your pastors and teachers. You need to make sure that every song that we sing um, is true. And if when you're looking through the song you see that a line is not true, then throw it out. Because you're responsible when you're leading us in worship. Um, 
Uh, so and if you're not sure that something's true, take it to your pastors and teachers and, and talk about it. But don't play a song because it has a catchy tune or because everybody's singing it. And you don't do that. I mean, we sang Wesley and we sang Luther and who knows else wrote those songs. We sang, sang great songs. They're very powerful, filled with so many great statements. Um, so you're not doing that, but beware because you can betray the congregation by singing what's false. Verse 16, but when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. He couldn't reconcile what he knew was true, that that statement that he thought was false, uh, but what he was seeing when he was looking at, at the, the proud wicked. So he needs to take the glasses off, and he got the glasses off in verse 17, which begins where he looks through the lens of the sanctuary. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their ends. The, glen, the lens fell off. The sanctuary lens came on. Now, I don't know what it was in the sanctuary that helped him to see their end, and I'm not going to surmise, but something in the sanctuary. This I do know. There's something in our gathering together that is uh, mysteriously powerful, and it's uh, supernatural powerful when we gather together. And you don't know what's, uh, how you're going to benefit uh, every week when you meet. He went into the sanctuary because it was his job, his daily job, to go in there and lead the worship. So thinking this, he went in, and in all of that worship experience, he realized that he was thinking wrongly, and it's not good to be the proud wicked. We discern their end. What is their end? Verse 18. Truly you set them in slippery places. So imagine that in their in their pride and their wickedness, they're, they're climbing, they're building a uh, business empire or getting power or fame, whatever it is, a following. Uh, they're climbing, but suddenly they realize under their feet is ice. Uh, ever have one of those dreams where you're trying to flee and your feet are going like crazy, but you're not moving anywhere? Or am I the only one that has those dreams? I got those two dreams where I'm trying to go somewhere I can't, and the other one is I'm preaching and I'm just speaking nonsense because I have no idea what I'm talking about. That's probably my biggest nightmare. Um, well, I have others. One time I was preaching and I realized I didn't have any pants on. And I was trying to figure out how I could get away from this, from not this pulpit, but from the pulpit wherever it was without anybody noticing. That's another nightmare. Never experienced it in real life, thank the Lord, yet. Um, anyway, um, so they're trying to climb. They can't climb anymore. They're on ice. And what happens when you're on a hill and you're on ice? You start to slip backwards. And if that's not enough, he says, you make them fall to, to ruin. He gives them a push. They're slipping backwards. He gives them a push. The higher you've climbed, the farther that fall is and the faster you're going when you hit the bottom. This reminds me of Tolkien when Gandalf is fighting the Balrog. He said that they cast him off the mountain and he fell to ruin on the mountainside. Kind of... Uh, powerful moment, but I think he got it from this text, that they fall to ruin, that God himself has cast them to ruin on the mountainside. Verse 19, how they are destroyed in a moment. So they have no time to repent. They're destroyed in a moment. Um, and, it, and it's all over. It's all done. Swept away utterly in terrors. There's no word in that statement except for the word by that is not fearsome, swept away um, utterly by terrors. I don't even know what that looks like, and I don't want to ever know what that looks like, but it doesn't look good. I don't want it to be my end, and I don't want it to be your end. I don't really want it to be anyone's end, because I would rather that they be going into the presence of Christ in their death. But these people will be swept away by their terrors. There's nothing to envy, Ossip sees now. Like a dream when one wakens, he realizes now that what he envied was just a dream. He was envying a dream. It's not real. Uh, he wakes up from it in the sanctuary, and he sees that it was all just dumb for him to envy like that. And then the last verse we're going to look at today O oh Lord, or the last phrase, O oh Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. Now, when in the Psalms especially, 
talk about God uh, getting up, it's not because he's been taking a nap. It means that he's now ready for judgment. So it's been grace, 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 judgment. And for these people, that's how it is. That's how the world is right now. We're experiencing grace, 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 grace. The church is going to be raptured, judgment. Um, and that's when God rouses himself. But look what it says. He, he will rouse himself, so he'll be ready to judge them at the great white throne or wherever his judgment will fall on them. You despise them as phantoms. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be despised by God. God is a loving God, but here with these people, when they come to their end, they don't see his love. He despises them as phantoms. That word is a, a difficult word to, to translate. It's, um, it, they're pretend people. They're not, he sees that they're not even human beings. They're more like uh, robots. Um, there's nothing to them. That's why it's translated phantoms. They're not real. They're pretend. Um, and then in a moment they're gone. I hope this is not the end for any of you. It's easy not to have this end. You call on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. You receive the free gift of salvation through his blood. It's as easy as that, really, um, to call on him. And then you don't have to worry about any of this, except for to live a life that's not filled with envy. This is what I'd like to leave you with. What uh, by the way, I'll be back next week to do the good part of the sermon, which is the next few verses. Um, but what Asaph envied, God despises. Chew on that. Father, we thank you for the warning in this text and how easily we slip into envy for the smallest things. And it seems at first to be um, not a big deal but it can ruin our lives, can fill us with angst, can make us do foolish things. So protect us from this. Help us to remember everything we sang about today, and we'll sing again, that as your children, there's nothing we need that you haven't given us. So we praise your name. Amen.